May the light of this candle guide us to truth-talking and traveling good paths. May we in turn share the light with those that we meet until it spreads to all peoples throughout this world that God so loves. Come, enter this sanctuary, whether in person or online, this home of West Plains Church family. Bring your joys and be thankful. Bring your troubles and be trusting. Bring your hearts to share in God's love. Our opening hymn, God, whose love is reigning o'er us, number 399 in Voices United, 399.
Let us pray. Holy Presence, loving God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. From north and south, from east and west, drawn by your majesty, we come to worship you. For the gift of this new day, fresh from your hand, we rejoice. For the renewal we know through friendship with Christ, we praise you. For the Spirit's energy blessing us in each moment, we honor you. Lord God, loving God, all of life is your gift, so give us glimpses of your splendor and love in this time of worship. Accept our praise offered in word and action. Creator, Redeemer, and Holy Spirit, here and everywhere, now and always. Amen. Well, hello everyone and welcome to West Plains in-person worship for the fifth Sunday after Pentecost. To those who continue to worship with us week by week online, I extend a warm welcome to you as well. This morning marks the beginning of my fifth year of ministry at West Plains, so time does seem to fly. Once again this morning, there will be lemonade available, uh, this time in the narthex, given the showers. Following worship and all who are present are invited to stay. We are grateful to those of you present and those who join with us online for the gifts that you offer to further God's mission and ministry as it's manifested in this particular community of faith. If you're looking for any information about giving or about many other community of faith matters, please check our website, www.westplains.ca. This morning, with the blessing of the worship committee, I'm going to begin a series of summer sermons on some passages of scripture that never appear in the three-year cycle of the ecumenical lectionary and truth to tell, never appear in any lectionary of any description. Um, there are stories and passages in the Bible that one might best describe as problematic for various reasons, whether because they're wildly improbable or they contain a generous measure of outrageous violence. We still, however, call all of this material word of God so the challenge that I will attempt to take up over the coming weeks is to discern how, with integrity, we might continue to find the Word of God in the midst of this material, some of which is unpleasant or distasteful to our contemporary ears. I'm beginning today with a lighter, perhaps more fitting story for a holiday weekend. Um, it's what might be termed a cautionary tale about a young man who is so bored by a sermon that tragic accidents ensue. Um, we need everybody safe today, so do try to stay awake if that seems to be possible. <laughs> and now uh, Judy Hansberger will offer the prayer of illumination. God of wisdom, sometimes your words seem so clear to us, yet at other times it is a puzzle or a challenge. Send your Holy Spirit to guide us as we listen to the scriptures today. Help us hear your word for our times and our lives. Through the grace of Christ, your living word, amen. The first reading is Psalm 4. You will find it on doesn't say the page, in Voices United, number 727. Answer me when I call, O God, defender of my cause, for you set me free when I was in distress. Be gracious to me now and hear my prayer. How long, 
You people, will you defame my honor? How long will you love what is worthless and seek lies? Know this, that God has chosen the faithful. God hears me when I call. Stand in awe and cease from sin. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Offer the sacrifices that are appointed and put your trust in God. There are many who say, Oh, that we might see prosperity. Lift up the light of your face on us, O oh God. But you have put gladness in my heart more than those whose grain and wine are plentiful. Safe and sound, I lie down and sleep. For you alone, God, make me dwell in safety. Second reading is Acts 20, verses 7 to 12. On the first day of the week, when we met to break bread, Paul was holding a discussion with them. Since he intended to leave the next day, he continued speaking until midnight. A man, young man named Euchus, who was sitting in the window, began to sink off into a deep sleep while Paul talked still longer. Overcome by sleep, he fell to the ground three floors below and was picked up dead. But Paul went down and, bending over him, took him in his arms and said, Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. Then Paul went upstairs, and after he had broken bread and eaten, he continued to converse with them until dawn. Then he left. Meanwhile, they had taken the boy away alive and were not a little comforted. For the word of God in scripture, among us and within us, thanks be to God. The next hymn is Come and Find the Quiet Center, found in Voices United 373. Thank you. 
American child psychologist Richard Rend is the co-author of a popular book called Raising Can-Do Kids, Giving Children the Tools to Thrive in a Fast-Changing World. In an article for Psychology Today, Rend reports that he is asked one question more frequently than any other by the parents and grandparents who consult him. That question is, <clears throat> what do you reply when your kid says to you, I'm bored? To the surprise of many of these concerned parents and grandparents, Ren's advice is that the problem is fundamentally the child's problem to solve. But for the benefit of those still seized by parental anxiety, Rend unpacks the issue of the bored child a bit further. He suge suggests that there is a deep signal in this question that the child is asking, and that this signal often eludes us in our worried culture. According to Rend, this is how it plays out. A parent will say that they are amazed that their kid is bored. How can they be bored? They ponder. There is so much stuff around to keep them occupied. All kinds of structured activities, schoolwork, every iteration of technology, so much more than we had when we were growing up. But it's here, says Rend, that the truth of the matter lies. Kids live in a world where the vast majority of their time is managed and scheduled. The stimulation is structured and the motivation tends to be outside of them and not internal to them. When a child is suddenly presented with nothing but free time, all the external stimulators begin to lose their luster after a relatively short time. So back to the question. What parents describe is that they typically ask their kids, how can you be bored? According to Rend, parents tend to get annoyed at this point and to start making suggestions to counter the boredom. How about this? How about that? Wren states that this response is not going to solve the problem because what your child is really saying is, I'm not engaged. The reason for this detachment is that children just don't get enough free time anymore, and consequently they don't know what to do with free time when they actually do get it. Plus the message our overscheduled and overstructured world is sending is that downtime, the time when you don't quite know what to do with yourself, is a bad thing. It's wasted time that should be spent doing something productive. Richard Rend continues his article by offering some sage advice for parents and grandparents to counter this contemporary problem. First of all, he says, recognize that it's not your place to come up with solutions to the boredom problem. It will only lead to more boredom because boredom is a signal that your child needs to come up with something on their own. Boredom isn't a bad thing, it's a good thing. An internal register that says, my brain is craving something and I need to muck around until I find that something that satisfies me. So maybe if you have this chat with your child or grandchild the next time they say they're bored, after a few trials when they say, I'm bored, you might smile sweetly and say, okay, got it. So enjoy your free time and figure out something to do that isn't boring to you and leave it at that. Of course, this strategy will work much better if we start giving children more free time and let them know that we value free time that it's theirs to enjoy however they like. It's also good to lead by example. Sometimes, Rend concludes, doing nothing is even more important than doing something, even if it doesn't actually lead to anything we might be inclined to consider productive. Perhaps in these matters, the pandemic has provided us with yet another opportunity for some much needed cultural learning. I have a feeling that parents of an earlier generation did a much better job of not fretting or feeling responsible when a child made the boredom pronouncement. As I recall in my own early years, if I ventured the phrase, I'm bored, 
The arched parental response would be a gentle suggestion that the root problem might be less that I was bored than that I stood at some risk of becoming boring. As a child, as an adult, I've attempted some improvement on that score, though perhaps with mixed results. It does, however, help the self-esteem of a contemporary preacher to realize that boredom, and especially the boredom of the young, is not a new phenomenon. After all, as the Bible records, one of the greatest Christian preachers of all time, the Apostle Paul, was perfectly capable of preaching such a long and stupefyingly dull sermon that he quite literally bored someone to death. As scripture recounts it, a young man who was sitting on a window ledge listening to Paul drone on and on fell asleep and suddenly plummeted three stories to the ground below. If the great apostle Paul couldn't knock the homiletic ball out of the park each and every time, perhaps the pressure should be off for the rest of us. But as gratifying as this realization is to clergy who preach regularly, it is not the crux of this curious story. Luke, the writer of Acts, narrates the events he offers with some helpful detail to help us understand what's taking place. The community of Christians, he says, had gathered together on a Sunday, the first day of the week, to break bread as was their custom. The great apostle Paul was among them. Paul planned to depart the next day, and this fact may have contributed both to his desire to get as much teaching in as possible and to the congregation's anxiety to get the chance to hear him. He was, after all, a first century celebrity. It seems then that for whatever reason, Paul was excited and inspired, so he continued to speak until after midnight. To help us comprehend how the accident that's about to take place came about, Luke notes that there were many lights in the upper chamber where this community had gathered for worship. For those of us in an electrical age, that might appear to be an odd detail to lift up. But people of an earlier era would know that oil lamps, in addition to offering light, produce smoke and heat. The atmosphere inside that upper story room would have been stiflingly close. At any rate, a young man named Eutychus happened to be sitting in the window as Paul's preaching evaded closure. Note the youth's posture of detachment. According to Luke, Eutychus, for that was the young man's name, sank into a deep sleep while well, Paul continued his lengthy oration. Overcome by slumber, says Luke, the young man fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. Some of you may remember a famous moment on the old Johnny Carson version of The Tonight Show when he read an advertisement from a Midwestern newspaper. It said... Lost dog, brown fur, some missing due to mange, blind in one eye, deaf, lame leg due to recent traffic accident, slightly arthritic, goes by the name Lucky. The same somewhat warped sense of humor operates in our biblical passage as well. Eutychus, the unfortunate young man whose state of boredom had such a catastrophic consequence in the Greek language means, you guessed it, lucky. At this point, however, the focus of attention in Luke's narrative turns from the prostrate Eutychus back to the apostle. The first thing that Paul does in response to the emergency is that he stops talking. Some cynics among you may be thinking that nothing short of nuclear catastrophe can interrupt a preacher in full stride. And from many years of sermon listening, I confess I've had such suspicions once or twice myself. I vividly recall sitting in church on a hot and humid summer morning listening to a retired minister's sermon that described the spiritual benefits of a walk in the local ravine. The sermon clocked in at 55 minutes, which would have been more than ample time for everyone in the congregation to have risen up from their pews, made exactly the same walk, and returned spiritually refreshed in time for lemonade. 
But in the description of this scene in the book of Acts, Paul, to his credit, instantly stops what he's doing and is first to rush down to ground level where poor Eutychus is lying. Perhaps scripture, scripture in its subtle way is trying to tell those of us in the contemporary church that our attention is required when a bored young person falls out the window or in our own context stops being part of the community. And there are some further questions that we might ask. For example, how metaphorically safe is the space we provide for young people? If we pay attention to the details of the story in Acts, the bored young man is on a window ledge. So on some level, he seems to be detached from the worship service that's taking place in that upper room. Would Eutychus have fallen asleep if he were involved in some meaningful way in what was going on or if he were given a position of leadership? Reading this story with a contemporary lens, I think that it asks if we in all of our churches are doing a good job of the spiritual mentorship of the generations who will succeed us. The next lesson for us in this extraordinary biblical scene also requires a bit of unpacking. Luke tells us that once Paul stopped preaching, he went immediately down to where Eutychus was lying and bending over him, he took the young man up in his arms. In the Greek, the word epipiasean carries more than a bit of urgency, more than we would find in an English translation. The word means he threw himself on him. Leaving aside the medical question of whether this would be the best course of action when dealing with potentially catastrophic injuries, there are some interesting implications that arise from Luke's use of, the, use of this particular verb. Paul clearly had no qualms about surrendering his dignity and station when he rushed to the young man's aid. Dignified people don't usually hurl themselves at others with such compassionate abandon, but that's precisely what Paul did. The P-I-P-S-A-N, as it happens, is a rare word in the New Testament, but it does appear in this exact grammatical form in one other place. Perhaps not surprisingly, that other place is in the Gospel of Luke. We find the word in the parable of the prodigal son. It occurs at the precise moment of the reunion between the gracious father in the parable and his formerly delinquent younger son. Here's what the Gospel text says. So he, younger son, went off, set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. And the PIP is saying, he threw himself at him and kissed him. As you will recall from the parable, the joyous father next calls out for the best robe to be found. He puts a ring on his wayward son's finger and sandals on his feet and tells the servants to get the fatted calf and kill it so that they can all eat and celebrate, for as the gospel tells it, the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. These words, the son of mine was dead and is alive again, have an echo in our story of the unlucky man named Lucky. Like the parable of the prodigal son, blame is decidedly off the table in the event that surround this poor young man's fall, while compassion is decidedly on the table. We are told flat out that Paul is preaching late. He and the rest of the community are sweating it out in a stuffy building and would clearly, a building that would clearly never pass a Burlington Health and Safety Code inspection. The sermon is meandering and the detached young person is bored, but all of these facts are beside the point. What Luke wants to emphasize is that young Eutychus, after he appears lost, experiences the grace of being found and taken up in loving, concerned arms. After being dead, the young man is alive again, 
he was lost, but now he is found. As if to emphasize this aspect, the first thing that Paul says after surrendering his dignity and throwing himself on the taken for dead boy is, do not be alarmed for his life is in him. These are strange words to accompany what appears to be a resurrection miracle. In narrative terms, what they accomplish is to shift the emphasis once again back from Paul to the young man. Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. In fact, Luke doesn't seem particularly interested in the more dazzling, miraculous resurrection aspects of the scene that have obsessed so many later biblical commentators. Instead, his attention, he draws attention to the important matter of the young man's restoration to life and his restoration to the community. It's clearly intentional then that the actions of the prodigal son's amazing father and of Paul the preacher share the same climactic verb, A-P-I-P-S-A-N. Both these men in authority abandon their dignity they sprint to a taken-for-dead boy, and they throw their arms around him. There is no time wasted in casting blame or exercising rights. The desire is for wholeness and for restoration. Further, to underscore the connection in the story of Eutychus and his unlucky but lucky fall, and the, restored, the restorative gesture is followed, just as it is in the prodigal son narrative, with feasting most likely also in our story by the celebration of the sacrament of Holy Communion. The grateful young man re-enters the community, and that grace is now shared by all. The incident ends with the reassuring sentence, and they took the lad away alive and were not a little comforted. Well, what are we finally to make of Eutychus and his unfortunate yet fortunate accident? Perhaps remembering and following Paul's example, we can stop our endless talking long enough actually to create, without blame on any side, gracious space in our churches for the fiercely young and for the deadly bored, most especially for those folk who may be teetering on the margins of our faith community because they don't quite seem to fit in. Within such metaphorical safe space, we can stop and look and listen. Perhaps we can take time lovingly to throw ourselves on those who may be in the process of checking out, letting them know that we're aware of the life flowing within them and that the life flowing within them matters to us because it is the future. And when we've enfolded them once again into the gathered body, perhaps we can also hold a feast announcing with enthusiasm the enthusiasm of the prodigal's father and of the apostle Paul, come celebrate and rejoice for what was dead has come to life. What was lost is found. Amen.
Let us pray. Generous God, what we return to you today has first come to us from you. Bless what we offer so that those in need may taste your abundance, which we know already in Christ, our living Lord. Amen. Let us gather our hearts and minds in prayer. God of heaven and earth, with joy and thanksgiving, we praise you for you create, sustain, and redeem all things, for making us in your image to love one another and to care for your creation, we give you thanks. For the gift of your beloved child, whose life is the pattern for our lives and learning, we give you thanks. For the energy of your spirit to inspire us in times of challenge and change, we give you thanks. Strengthen us in these challenging times to show your love to others. As we pray for the church and those who lead it to find new ways of reaching out in a culture with changing values, for creation that we may learn to reverence and care for it. For those who lead the nations of the world, that they may work for the well-being of the most vulnerable and seek peace together. For those who make decisions about healthcare, education, and social services in these times when there are many demands in every area, remembering at this time Olivia Chow, who is mayor elect of the City of Toronto and who officially will assume her immense responsibilities on July 12th. For the poor, the hungry, and those struggling to find affordable housing when prices for everything seem to rise each day. For those who struggle with illness, addiction, disability, or despair, and for those who mourn the loss of someone dear and irreplaceable. for the powerless and the oppressed wherever they live, and for those who work to defend them. Hear us now as we pray in silence for situations on our hearts this day, remembering at this time within our own community, Jan, Marnie, Joan, Keith Burns, Lawrence and Tilly. Eternal God, we thank you for listening to us in every situation. Keep our eyes open for your spirit at work among us. Equip us to respond to someone else's prayer as your servants, for we offer ourselves to you in the words Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our concluding hymn is in Voices United at number 329. O Jesus Christ, may grateful hymns be rising. your eyes open as you walk in God's world, alert for occasions to share God's love. And may the God who made us, the Christ who mends us, and the Spirit who gives us life walk with you each and every day. Oh.